Okay, great. So let me turn to uh, my topic, um, which is literacy for English learners. What's reading science got to do with it? Uh, so before I get to the meat of the matter, I'd, I'd like to pause a little bit on this. Reading science. Um, sadly, the term reading science or science of reading has become very problematic uh, over the past few months or year or so. And it's become something of a lightning rod for all the arguments and disagreements we've had over the years, you know, sometimes referred to as the reading wars. Lately, a new aspect has, has opened up, uh, dealing specifically with, with English learners. And so that the question that people are asking is what I'm posing in the title of my talk, Literacy for English Learners, what's reading science got to do with it? So, what does reading science, science of reading, have to do with uh, English learners? So a lot of people, and among them uh, English learner advocates, what I consider, I consider myself an English lear learner advocate. I've been working in this field for 40 years and always with English learners, either as a teacher, as a researcher, or, um, as a teacher trainer. And a lot of these advocates who I consider my colleagues are not just posing the question, they're telling you their answer. And they're saying that science of reading is not useful for English learners. And one of the reasons they say is because the science of reading is based on monolingual readers, especially English monolingual readers. And I'm here to tell you that this, this is simply false. It is untrue. And in my presentation, I'm gonna cite studies that have been undertaken with bilinguals and emergent emergent bilinguals, not only in the United States, but around the world. There's a worldwide literature. And anyone who says it's all based on monolinguals simply does not know the research and doesn't realize that there's research that can really help inform us to do a better job supporting English learners than we're currently doing. So that's really my goal here, to share with you some of the research that can help us do better. And you know the saying, no better, do better, and for sure, we have to be doing better than we're doing now. And so maybe we should just stop saying or using the term science of reading or reading science, since become, it's become needlessly polarizing. And instead of reading science, talk about the best research that we have on how students learn to read and how best to support them. And that's what matters. It doesn't matter really what you call it. Either way, we have to figure out how to turn the term reading science or whatever you call it, instead of a lightning rod into what science should be, right? A source of enlightenment and a, science, a source of knowledge and insight that will help us accomplish what we need to accomplish in this world. So that's the framing I'd like to start off with. Okay, so let's think about teaching just in general, right? Think about teaching just in general. And, and I, I know you've heard some of these phrases, but I, I want you to think about whether teaching is rocket science, uh, a phrase of a very prominent and popular article written by Louisa Mote some years ago, or is teaching reading not that complicated, which is the title of a book by Phyllis Hunter that has gotten a lot less uh, notoriety and publicity, unfortunately, because she provides an interesting sort of contrast with the rocket science perspective. So think about that. Is teaching reading rocket science or is it not that complicated? Now think about this. Many students around the world learn to read and, and write, of course, in a language they're simultaneously learning to speak and understand. They are part of all learners, right? They're English learners, but they're part of our student population. English learners is what we call them in the United States. I was recently in Australia. They call them EAL students, English as an additional language. If you're learning in a second language in Greece, because you come from Ethiopia, say, you're a Greek learner, Greek as a second language. So students around the world are, we're not unique in that regard is what I'm trying to say. So think about this, is teaching reading to these students 
students who are learning to read in a language they are simultaneously learning to speak and understand, is teaching reading to these students rocket science or not that complicated? Or is it closer to one or to the other? And I'd like you to just pop in the chat the answer to this question. Is teaching reading to students simultaneously learning the language rocket science or is it not that complicated? Or is it closer to one or the other? And you can answer one word or jot down some thoughts. Uh, and you can say, I don't know, not sure. These are all acceptable. Just take a couple of seconds to think about that and jot down some notes in the chat. I'm practicing my wait time in, in case you haven't noticed, which is hard for me because of my tendency is just to keep talking. Okay, so I think we have a few notes jotted down and some thoughts. Okay, so now I want you to think about this. If you're learning to read in the language, you're simultaneously learning to speak and understand. Is it basically similar to or different from learning to read in the language you already know? All right, you're learning to read in the language, you're simultaneously learning to speak and understand, is it basically similar to or different from learning to read in a language you already know? So answer this in the chat, which is true. Learning to read in a language you're simultaneously learning is basically the same as learning to read in a language you already know. Learning to read in a language you are simultaneously learning is basically different from learning to read in a language you already know. Or no clue, you tell me, that's why I'm here. So think for a second or two and answer A, B, or C. And I'm a very easy grader, so and this is a safe space, no blame, no shame. Okay, so are you ready for the answer? I know the suspense is killing you. Okay, there's the answer. Learning to read in a language you are simultaneously learning is basically the same is learning to read in a language you already know. That's the answer. If you wrote down no clue, you tell me that's okay. It's fine. I'm here to try to help you understand the answer to the question. So my basic position here is that whether it's rocket science or not, learning to read in a language you are learning to speak and understand is complicated. I think we can all agree with that. And therefore, so is the teaching. Can't get away from it. But here's some good news. Some good news, it's, it's basically the, similar to learning to read in a language you already know. But, and here's a qualifier, similar is not the same thing as identical. So this is the basic argument that I'm going to make uh, in my comments today, that learning to read in a language you're simultaneously learning is basically similar to, similar to learning to read in a language you already know, but then similar is not identical. And so this contention of mine, this proposition that I'm going to be advancing and, and arguing for raises three questions. The first question is, what do we know from the science of reading about how children learn to read when they know the reading language? And the second question is, how is it similar or different from how children learn to read as they're learning the language? And then finally, how does the teaching need to be similar or different for students who are learning the language in contrast to students who already know the language? Now, let me say a word or two about bilingual education very briefly, which I will not be talking about. As you know, bilingual education is the single most controversial issue in this whole field and has been for, I mean, three quarters of a century, long, long time, <clears throat> excuse me. And bilingual education is desirable for, for many reasons. Uh, and we can get into that if people are interested in, in it. I'm, I'm a big fan of bilingual education for some reasons you might not actually anticipate, but the vast majority of English learners don't have the benefit of bilingual education. So the, the, and the reality on the ground is simply that most English learners have to become literate in a language they're simultaneously learning to speak and understand. That's just the reality on the ground. 
I, I wish it were different. I wish we as a country valued bilingualism and bilingual education, not just for English learners, but for the entire populace. But the fact is we don't, and we have the situation we have. So most of the students will be facing the kind of situation that I'll be talking about. But please, no one leave this session thinking that I'm advocating English only because that would be incorrect. Okay, let's go back to our uh, three questions. And by answering these, I, I hope you'll see why I say that reading science um, is relevant for all learners, including learners learning to read in a language they're simultaneously learning. So let's start with the first question. What do we know from the science of reading or whatever you want to call it, reading research, how children learn to read when they know the reading language? Now, here's what the science of reading gets really sciencey and, and, and very cool, because when, when neuroscientists, brain scientists started kind of looking under the hood, what they found, let me make sure you can see the whole thing. Can you see the whole slide there? I'm trying to adjust my screen a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Because what reading scientists have discovered is that learners who know the language already, sorry, we're, we're talking about kids who know the language, or adults for that matter, learners who know the language already, they rely on a large network of brain regions as they try to bind orthography, the spelling system of a, of a written language, to an already present knowledge of phonology, the sounds of the language, and the semantics, which is the meaning carried by the language. Now, all these quotations from about the brain, not necessarily the picture, I picked that up somewhere else, comes from an issue of the journal Neurolinguistics, which I would strongly encourage you to take a look at. The references are in the bibliography, so you'll be able to access them. If there's an article you're interested in that you can't get because it's behind a paywall, just email me and I'd be glad to, to send it to you. But this is the nut of the matter. This is what happens when the brain is learning to read. There's a binding, a, a connecting of orthography, the spelling system, phonology, the sound system, and the semantics carried by the language. That's the foundation of reading. That's what needs to happen in the brain. Okay, so le learning to read essentially entails going from speech, phonology, to print. That's the famous phrase by Louisa, another famous phrase. She's great with these phrases, by the way, by Louisa Motes, speech to print. Because the speech came first, as you know, oral speech, oral language is about 300,000 years old in the human species. It literally evolved with hum humans and humanity. Whereas the writing system is much more recent, about 5,000 years and alphabetic systems are even more recent, about 3,500 years. So going from speech, which came first to print is the essence of learning to become literate. The learning system in which oral speech is represented by written symbols. And this is at the level of brains and neurons, right? Now, so beginning in early literacy, in alphabetic writing systems and in some non-alphabetic as well, but let's just stick to alphabetic writing systems, requires learning the alphabetic principle, the idea that letters represent speech sounds, that spoken words comprise individual sounds, and that the sound symbol system, otherwise known as phonics, is the most reliable way to read words. And this is true even in opaque orthographies. And by opaque orthography, I mean orthographies such as English, which are highly irregular. Now, keep in mind that English is more regular than irregular. By and large, the regularities rule, but there are sufficient irregularities that it makes it more complicated to learn English. Uh, it's not as transparent, that's why it's opaque, in contrast to a language like Finnish, uh, a written language like Finnish or Spanish, which is much more transparent because there's a much more one-to-one -one correspondence between letters and the sounds they represent. But even in opaque orthographies, such as, uh, such as English and others, uh, Russian as I understand it, uh, even in these opaque orthographies, the sound symbol system or phonics is the most reliable way to read words, okay? You gotta draw on other sources of information, but that's the most reliable way to read words initially. And then word recognition by decoding using context and meanings secondary, secondarily in order to reinforce or to confirm whether what you read is correct. And I'll get into that in, in, in a few minutes. 
word recognition by decoding with context and word meaning secondary is the way to teach and learn how to read. And then all of this working toward fluency, fluency that glues together the various components of the literacy systems and of the brain circuitry that is required to acquire literacy. So these foundations are necessary at the level of learning to read, for individuals to learn to read, understanding the alphabetic principle, that spoken words comprise individual sounds, the sound symbol system known as phonics, that word recognition by decoding with context and word meanings secondary, always working toward automaticity and fluency. Now, these are not sufficient. Many of the things must kick in for students to develop as proficient readers. Remember, it's phonology, orthography, and semantics has got what has to be bound or glued together. But we know that these foundational skills are essential for becoming a reader. But if you all, all you have is a foundation, regardless of whether you're an English learner or a fully proficient student, if all you have is a foundation, you really haven't got much, right? I mean, I personally wouldn't like to live there. I mean, the foundation looks pretty solid to me, but I like my houses with rooms, you know, and bathrooms and living rooms and, you know, maybe a backyard or something like that. But the foundation is still essential. Even though it's not sufficient, it's still essential because without a good foundation, you got things like this. Sometimes they're picturesque tourist attractions, but more often than not, they're quite dangerous and lethal. So foundations are essential for sure. So now the question is, how similar or different from learning, how, I'm sorry, how similar or different from how children learn to read? Let me try that again. I've read this so many times and I keep messing it up. How is it similar or different? How is learning to read similar or different from how children learn to read as they're learning the language, right? The question is, we know that you near, in order to learn to read, you need to bind the orthography, the phonology, and the semantics when you know the language. But then how is it similar or different if you're learning to read as you're learning the language? Well, it turns out that learning to read in the language you're learning is basically the same as learning to read in the language you already know. And how do we know this? Well, we know this because they involve similar networks of brain activation. The same parts of the brain need to be activated and the brain circuitry needs to be constructed because we're not born ready to process written language. That circuitry has got to be constructed. The brain portions are there. They need to be activated. They need to be connected. They need to be bound together. But whether you're proficient in the language you're learning to read in, or you're learning the language you're learning to read in, that it involves similar networks of brain activation. And again, I would refer you to the Journal of Neurolinguistics where, where I got all these words that are in between quotes. Now, I wanna emphasize here that there is a worldwide literature on this. In fact, the Journal of Neurolinguistics, I mean, draws on research and studies and, and, and analyses and brain scans and behavioral studies from lots and lots of different languages. It's not just about English, and it's certainly not just about monolingual English speakers in the United States. This is a worldwide literature with lots of first and second languages. And these, there are students all over the world learning to read and developing as readers in languages they are simultaneously learning. So it's a very robust research base. So the question is, it involves similar networks of brain activation to do, to do what exactly? Well, what we've been talking about, to link print and speech, to support phonological awareness, letter sound mapping, and the other foundational reading processes, such as decoding and phonics, bringing to the semantics in. It's the same networks of brain activation to lay those foundations for literacy. 
the foundations are identical, regardless of whether you're learning to read in a language you know or a language you're learning. Letters represent speech sounds. Letters and sounds combined to represent comprehensible words. Uh, com sorry, comprehensible words and familiar sounds of the language to how those words and sounds are represented in writing. Uh -huh. comprehensible and familiar sounds. This is exactly, precisely where the differences exist in teaching reading. I should say literacy more generally because it involves reading and writing. This is where the difference exists in teaching literacy to students who are proficient in the language in English and students who are learning the language as they're learning to read it. Because what is comprehensible and familiar to an English speaker is not necessarily going to be comprehensible and familiar to an English learner. Remember the diagram and the quote that I gave several slides ago. Learners who know the language rely on a large network of brain regions they, as they try to bind orthography to an already present knowledge of phonology and semantics. So from the standpoint of an English speaker, all they have to learn, and I say all in quotation marks, all they have to learn is the orthography and then map that on to the sounds and to the meaning. But for an English learner, they not only have to learn the orthography, they got to familiarize themselves with the phonology, the sounds of the language and the semantics, how that language makes meaning preeminently among the vocabulary, but not just the vocabulary, there's also syntax involved in discourse features, all the ways that languages make and construct and communicate meaning. For the learner of the language, that's new information for them to varying degrees. We know that English learners come to school, whether they're in kindergarten or fourth or fifth grade, they come with varying degrees of English proficiency. So some will be more or less familiar with the sounds and the meanings of language than others. But compared to your typical English speaking, English proficient, six year old or seven year old or eight year old, an English learner is going to be much less familiar with the sounds and the meanings of the language. And that's really where the differences reside. So, as a result, learning to read in the language you know and one you're learning is not exactly the same. The difference and the differences increase as readers progress and language proficiency becomes more critical for comprehension. And therefore, what happens is that language learners, let me advance this, there we go. Language learners require additional supporting brain regions during learning, during learning literacy. Why? Because they have no or limited already present knowledge of phonology and semantics, right? That is the nub of the issue. They have no or limited already present knowledge of phonology and semantics. And remember, the phonology and semantics of the language have got to be bound to the orthography of the language. And if you're unfamiliar with all three of those, you have a tougher job. And so do your teachers. Now, I want to switch from brain science, which is so science-y, right? It's really interesting and quite fascinating. And these are developments that have happened over the past, you know, 20 years or so. It's re relatively recent. But it's not just brain science. Because we know from some classroom intervention studies that, th that the same conclusions can be supported. That the foundation of learning for learning to read is the same whether you're learning to read in the language you are learning to read in the language you are learning to speak and understand, or one you already know. But they're not identical. Language learners require additional supports. So here's our $64,000 question. So how does the teaching need to be similar or different for students who are learning the language as they're learning to read it? So the best clues we have for this don't really come from the brain science. I mean, the brain science can't tell you how to teach any of this. They can just tell you what needs to happen in the brain. 
in order for literacy to be acquired and developed and more neurons firing and the circuitry being established, right? That's what the brain science can tell you. But how you teach it, how you actually enact that information is something that can only come from intervention studies, the classroom studies, behavioral studies with students as they're learning to read. And the best clues for this come from these two really seminal studies with English learners. And each of these studies began with a successful intervention for English speakers and then modified it to provide language support for English learners, right? And this makes sense that even here, this is consistent with the brain science because the brain science is telling us that it's basically the same process, but that the brain needs additional supporting regions because the knowledge of the language is not that familiar to the learner of the language. So they begin with the successful intervention for English speakers and then modify it to provide language support, just as the brain science would predict. And the interventions provided ample English, oral English instruction to support the English literacy instruction. And both of these obtain moderate to strong effects on early English literacy development for beginning and beginning early English readers who are having difficulty. These are interventions for students who are not getting on track in their literacy understanding, phonemic awareness, letter sound association, beginning phonics, decoding, fluency, and all of that. So the full citations for these two studies you can find in the reference list uh, with full references. Again, if you have trouble getting them because they're still behind a paywall, they're not really new studies. They've been around for quite a while. Uh, it's always surprising to me, particularly among English learner advocates who are not aware of these studies, or if they're aware of them, they they don't they don't cite them. But I think they're most perhaps the most useful in terms of nuts and bolts uh, suggestions, uh, directions for what to do to help English learners uh, get traction in early and beginning uh, literacy. So do take a, a, a look at the citations, and if you can't find them, just email me. So both of these, as I said, began as effective interventions for English monolingual struggling readers. None of, this, none of these components should be a surprise. The goal was fluent, meaningful reading, direct instruction was used, phonemic awareness, letter knowledge, the usual suspects, text fluency, comprehension strategies. The activities included writing letters, sounding out, reading words, dictation, reading and rereading, decodable text, and so on and so forth. And then to that monolingual intervention, the study added these language supports. They would clarify the words and the content with visuals and gestures. It's sometimes called sheltered instruction. Uh, the key vocabulary words were highlighted and illustrated. Uh, the, the, the students received instruction in English language use and students responded. So this was English language development, not just comprehensible input, but also comprehensible output. They wanted the students to really be familiar, be conversant with the language, the words and the text that were being used to teach them to read. And they also engaged in guided book, uh, guided book and story retelling and discussion. So it was the definitions of the words, the clarification of the words, but also the utility, the use of the words in discourse, in talking about, in read, not just reading, but talking about it. And this is super important because we're talking here about a, a pretty restricted and focused type of English language development. Because what you wanna focus on for purposes of literacy, particularly beginning and early literacy, you wanna focus on the language, the meaning of the words and the text that were being used to teach these beginning literacy skills. Now, these students definitely need more expansive ELD so that they can participate in the rest of the curriculum in school and, and beyond and out of school. So you wanna provide ELD on all, all sorts of aspects of the content area, the social studies, the science, the whatever. I mean, we need an expansive agenda to teach English language development, but specifically for the purposes of literacy, they need to be conversant, familiar, understand the meanings, the semantic messages of the words they're being taught to read. And you'll see why this is so important in this next slide. 
And this comes from Linnea Airy's study, the second of the two really seminal studies, where she describes what the purpose of the study was and also very, gives very important insight as to what they were teaching the students, how to actually navigate and interact with the text. So she writes, one purpose of the intervention was to develop oral language by encouraging students to talk about the books and by explaining the meanings of new vocabulary words. These words were written in students' personal books and the meanings were reviewed each time the book was read. Okay, now here comes the good part. Students were encouraged to decode unknown words by relying on their letter sound knowledge, okay? Foundational skills. We're talking about decoding the unknown words by relying on letter sound knowledge, using your foundational skills, and then, and then cross-checking with meaning and pictures to confirm the identities of the words. And this is extremely important because remember the additional support the brain needs. If you don't provide support in terms of understanding the meanings of the words, you can't cross-check. It's just impossible. If you teach beginning reading as a series of rote letter sound associations and, and CVC decoding skills, but don't pay attention to the meaning of the words, how can you possibly engage in this fundamental process of first decoding using your foundational skills and then using your metacognition to think, okay, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense there. Let's go on. Nope, it doesn't make sense. Let's try it again. That which is exactly the kind of mental processes that you want to inculcate, inculcate in early readers, whether they're ELs or non-ELs. The difference is that for ELs, you need to make sure they know those words so they can engage in this process. If they don't know the meanings of the words, they can't do this. Now, I want to just pause very briefly here and make a very important distinction between what Airy discuss, describes as the process that they're trying to teach the kids to engage in and how this is different from what's sometimes called three cueing or balanced literacy. As you probably know, the three cueing approach means suggests that you tell students that there are different cues they can draw on to recognize words. They can look at pictures, they can think of context, they can think of syntax, they might look at the first letter of the word. And, but there's no real systematicity to it. You know, it's called balance, but it's not really balance. I think it's, it's kind of irrational and it's kind of random because what students are taught to do is, well, you got this little basket of cues, whether three of them or four of them, the, you know, depending on how you count these things, and you choose which one to use. And then if that one doesn't work, go to the next one. If that one doesn't work, choose some other one. Whereas here, with the strategy here is having students, remember what I said a little while ago, that the most reliable way to re recognize words is by using your foundational skills. Because even though English is, has some irregularities, it is more regular than irregular. So that's your first plan of attack, if you'll pardon the militaristic metaphor when you're trying to read a word, use your foundational skills. But then you wanna think, ha, huh, does that make sense? It's not random, it's gotta be systematic. You've gotta use your foundational skills as the first pass at reading a word, but then be able to draw on your semantic system to confirm or disconfirm. So what's the bottom line for beginning and early reading for English learners. Well, first of all, I think teach the so-called big five explicitly. Phonemic awareness, letter sounds, decoding, fluency, comprehension. Those are all uh, relevant. I think I forgot vocabulary there. My bad, <laughs> I miscounted. Actually, I got the wrong five. Vocabulary should be in there. That's one of the big five of the national reading panel. My apologies. And then you wanna make sure the content and the instructions are comprehensible to students. And it's okay to use strategic uh, L1 strategically, which is not bilingual education. You know, there are different ways of using the home language. One way is strategically using the first language to use cognates, maybe brief definitions, brief explanations. So you're not teaching in the first language, but you're using that to kind of bootstrap 
uh, comprehension and understanding in the target language, which is English. So just because you're not doing bilingual education doesn't mean that the first language doesn't have a potentially productive role to play in instruction and in what is otherwise basically English medium instruction. And then you want to make sure you provide English language development instruction and opportunities that directly support the reading instruction, right? That directly support the kinds of things that you're teaching these students to read. They need to have that kind of language development that allow them to engage in the process that Linnea Airy so effectively describes. Read using fair foundational skills, then confirm using meaning and context. And then in addition, as I put in the parentheses here, you need general ELD that's not limited to the words and the text that students are being uh, taught to read. So that's kind of like tier one instruction. I mean, I know we're in an RTI conference, so I want to make sure that we make reference to RTI. Uh, this is sort of, an, as you probably know, an MTSS term, but this is what tier one instruction, good classroom instruction should include. And then the question is, what if students aren't getting it? You know, what, what is the necessary support? What is sufficient? Well, we don't have any good algorithms for this or formula. At least not that I know. If anyone ha knows any, please let me know because it would be information for me. But what I what I do know or what I think pretty clearly is that your tier two instruction needs to include more and tier three instruction needs to include even more and more intensively drawing on these foundational skills that are supporting, supporting the brain circuitry that you're helping students to build. And it needs to be systematic, it needs to be explicit, and it needs to be cumulative. Now, let me turn just for a few minutes on some things that are not working, that will not work, that I would not assume would work for English learners and emergent bilinguals. First of all, a heavy diet of phonics and decoding with insufficient attention to the meanings of words and text. It is not likely to work. And secondly, as I've already mentioned, I won't belabor this, 3 queuing, which uses a combination of letters, syntax, pictures, and context clues to recognize work. Uh, sorry, to recognize words. These are not high probability working strategies. So what would work instead is as much foundational skill instruction as needed to master the code with ample attention to word and text meanings and then students learning to read words using decoding first, then confirming accuracy using meaning and context. So in sum, what we're looking at are those first two foundational skills to master the code, ample attention to word and text meanings, learning to read words using decoding skills, then confirming accuracy with meaning and context, and additional other things, continued ELD to support comprehension of text, content and background knowledge, building on student assets, relevant motivating learning experiences. All of these things are important for English learners and for teachers to keep in mind. And, and these are the tools and the strategies that we can use within an RTI or MTSS framework to help English learners achieve the highest possible levels of literacy development, which is I'm positive why we're all here today. Now, finally, let me say a few words. I'm gonna to try to do this relatively quickly because I wanna make sure we pay attention to this because most of this has been focused on early and beginning literacy, which of course is very important. But we know that after beginning and early literacy comes intermediate and more advanced stages of literacy. So what happens after beginning and early literacy? Well, it's the same basic ideas, you know, that. English learners need what everybody else need, but with additional supports, primarily because of they're learning the language. I mean, by definition, our English learners are learning, learning the language. So English language development and building background knowledge must begin at school entry at, because they become increasingly crucial. One of the things that skeptics or opponents, let's say, of science of reading like to say, particularly for English learners, is that, well, these science of reading people say, well, first you have to teach them how to code, and then you teach them comprehension, and, and then you teach them knowledge, and then you teach them things. That is absolutely untrue. And if anyone's doing that, they're not listening to the science of reading. 
Because if you pay attention to the science of reading, it lets you know, you know, everyone is familiar with the simple view of reading. You have word recognition and language comprehension. I assume you all are familiar with the reading rope, with Scarborough's reading rope, the two big strands, word recognition and language comprehension. Those, both of those clumps of things need to happen at the same time. They don't happen in the same lesson as the three queuing advocates like to advocate. But while you're teaching decoding skills, foundational skills at one part of the literacy block or during the day, you also have to do things like read alouds and have opportunities for conversations and discussions and show videos and provide experiences. So you've gotta be working on both sides of the fence, so to speak, because eventually those two have gotta converge. And if you wait until kids are fluent decoders before you start teaching knowledge and background knowledge and language development, they're gonna be behind the eight ball. So it just, it just doesn't make sense. And anyone who tries to reduce the science of reading to being just about phonics and decoding is either misinformed or is trying to mislead you. So language development and building background knowledge have to begin at school entry. They become increasingly cr crucial, but that does not mean that those foundational skills are not important because they are. So the language of, of demands of the school become exponentially more difficult as everyone knows. Literacy becomes increasingly dependent on higher levels of English proficiency. Knowledge of the world becomes increasingly important, but the foundations remain important. So I wanna spend a, some time talking about this. Why do foundations still matter? Well, read this sentence to yourself. Read it out loud, just to hear the sonic reverberations of your voice. Okay, read it meaningfully. Okay, now compare what you just did. Think about what happens if you have to read it this way. Nature, natural, na re re resort, resource, 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 can, D, 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 Dieter, Dieter, Dieter mine? Uh, ca country, country, countries, economy, economy, output, output, and pro, 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 production. What do you have? You have a bottleneck. Even if you have adequate oral proficiency, adequate vocabulary, content and world knowledge, even if you can decode reasonably well as my made up student could, what's missing? Well, the foundational reading skills of fast, accurate word recognition and reading fluency. And missing these foundational skills creates a bottleneck. And one of your missions has got to be as students go up the grades to eliminate bottlenecks. And I'm gonna suggest a couple of general strategies for eliminating bottlenecks. And I'm not gonna be able to spend a lot of time on any one of them, but just to give you some ideas, there's some resources in the back. And if, they're, and if I didn't put them in, then just email me and I'll send them to you that might provide some additional help. So one way to eliminate bottlenecks is by working on word recognition. You wanna make sure that all decoding rules are known and can be applied automatically. And there are some advanced decoding rules. I'm not a big fan of extending decoding up to the grades by and large. It should be done by something like, I don't know, roughly second grade, just to give a number, give a grade. But there are more advanced ones that some students require more time to learn, absorb, and become able to apply automatically. That's the thing, fluency and automaticity really matter and they matter even more as you go up the grades. You wanna practice recognizing irregular words and reading them fluently. You wanna make sure students carefully sound out new words, then practice reading them fluently. You wanna use things like cumulative word list or flashcards to increase automaticity, sometimes games and friendly competitions handled you know, in, the, in a right and appropriate way can be helpful. You wanna use known words, words that students can read and decode 
to challenge students' automatic recognition. So they do it more and more quickly. The concept of orthographic mapping has been provided to us by Linnea Airy, mostly to talk about early readers, but it's also relevant for later readers. You want them to recognize automatically and have orthographically mapped more increasingly complex words. They're essential for fluency and automaticity. And of course, lots and lots and lots of reading. So those are some general strategies for word recognition, but then you also wanna wor work on reading fluency, which is more than just reading words quickly. You, wanna, you, you need to recognize that fluency is more than reading words quickly because it includes chunking words into meaningful phrases, noting morphology and punctuation, processing the connections within and between sentences, and integrating intonational patterns to mark syntactic phrasing. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but think about it. If you were to read this aloud, I'm going to read it aloud because I'm a relatively proficient reader. Natural resources can determine a country's economic output and productivity. Now, I did not read it like this. Natural resources can determine a country's economic output and productivity. I could. I could also read natural resources can determine a country's economic output and productivity. I could do that too. That's fast. That's automatic. Is it fluent? Well, no, not really, because fluency means reading it appropriately with appropriate intonation. And notice the sort of the chunking that I did. I said natural resources can determine a country's economic output and productivity, right? I chunked it in a way that was meaningful for me and would make it more meaningful to the listener. And that is part of fluency. It's called, the technical term is prosody. You're reading it as if it's meaningful, respecting the meaning, respecting the relationships of the words within the sentences. So let me try to summarize the relevance of reading science for all learners is, I hope, a message that you take from my talk today. But I'm talking about reading science comprehensively understood, right? Not reduced to some kind of bare bones notion of foundational skills. I'm talking about reading science that respects, understands, documents, teaches us about the importance of foundational skills, word recognition, but also all those language and cognitive features, attributes, and skills that give literacy its meaning, its purpose, its reason for existence. That's all part of the science of reading. So what we know from reading science, if you understand it correctly, or at least as I understand it, applies to all language learners. Foundational reading skills are essential for learning to read. Language, vocabulary, knowledge, and comprehension skills are needed for continued development for all readers, all learners, learners and readers. And in addition, language learners need support to understand words and text they are learning to read as they use their foundational skills to read them. And then they will need continued additional support as reading challenges get more complex and foundational skills remain foundational. So these are some of the references that I've used. As I said, if you hit a paywall, let me know, I'll be happy to send. And here's the obligatory multilingual thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I believe the first question I didn't write down who posed this question uh, early on was, what about kids that are not literate in their um, first L1? And, and so yeah. that might just be kind of a general, what do you have to say about? Well, that, I mean, that, that's, that an ex, that's an excellent question uh, because it's very important. Um, and I'm sure those of you who have, who have taught, particularly kids beyond the early elementary, third, fourth, fifth grade, middle school, and so forth, you've discovered that if a student comes to you literate in his or her home language, that's a whole different ballgame. Typically, in the absence of any disability or anything like that, but typically, <laughs> excuse me, student who's literate in his or her home language will relatively easily make the transition to becoming literate in English. Depending on the language they're coming from, um, there's always gonna be some transfer. 
if you think about Spanish, for example, <clears throat> which is the language I know best next to English, basically all the consonant sounds transfer. It's the vowels that give us big headaches because in Spanish, each vowel has only one and only one sound. Whereas in English, vowels have all sorts of different sounds depending on where they, they're placed. Plus we have a bunch of irregularities in English. So you've got those challenges. But the important thing is that the, they know the idea of reading. Like they know, they understand the alphabetic principle. You know, the idea that words are made up of individual sounds. They may not be able to say phonemic awareness, for example, but they have the, they, they at least intuit the concept that words up are made up of sounds and those sounds are represented by letters. And that, that's a major insight that's called the alphabetic principle. So if they know that, you got a big conceptual leap ahead already done for you. So there's lots of advantages to building on first language literacy. In fact, you should build on first language literacy. Now, the real challenge comes from kids, most of them with interrupted schooling, who don't have literacy skills in their home language. Uh, and they're in fourth or fifth grade, or they have very irregular skills. They have some, so one of the first tasks is to find out what kind of skills they have in their home language, because you want to build on those. And the more of those they have, the more you have to build on and the easier the transition will be. Conversely, the less they have, then the more challenges you have. And say you have a kid in sixth, fifth grade, some something beyond you know kindergarten, first, second grade, who really has no literacy in their first language, you got to start with the foundational skills because you cannot read if you don't have those foundational skills. If you don't, if you're not able to bind the orthography with the phonology with the semantics, it really boils down to that. And, and it's a challenge because a lot of the materials that we have are for, you know, kindergarten, first, second grade. There are some materials, they're, they're not so easy to find, although I, I suspect listeners would probably have some suggestions they can put in the um, they can put in the chat uh, there are materials when I taught junior high years ago I used to use high interest low level reading materials for kids I was teaching kids who were like maybe at a pre-primer level maybe a second third grade level none of them were actually literally non non-readers but they were pretty low so I'd have to find high interest materials that were um, at, at you know very beginning levels, but you've got to get those foundational skills down one way or the other because literacy is simply not possible without them. Thank you so much, and um, I believe that was Stacy, and she said thank you for your thoughts. Um, it's a huge challenge, and there are many questions. So, um, so actually, I'm going to move on to there's two questions that kind of um, were along the same line, so I'm going to pose them together. And maybe you can have some thoughts on these. Sure. So the first was from Paulette. She noted recently here in Oregon, uh, an education professor who researches English learner literacy instruction publicly reiterated her position that programs based on three queuing are still the best for ELL students. How can we as a community create movement toward teacher prep programs embracing reading science? And then there was another question that seems kind of in that similar vein um, that was posed by Julia Sparza Brown. Hi, Julie. Um, why is there so much pushback on science of reading from NCEL and powerful bilingual educators? I wish I, I, wish I knew. <laughs> I, I can only speculate. Uh, I've been involved, yes. I and mean, I'm not divulging any secrets here, but I've been involved really for the better part of this year in discussions, conversations, emails, webinars, meetings with, you know, NCEL and, and their local chapter here in California, Californians Together, trying to sort through exactly this. And, you know, I mean, I don't want to, I don't like saying bad things about colleagues, you know, people who are in the field, in the trenches, but I, I, I really don't understand the source of the opposition. Um, 
this work that I've been engaged in over the past year really was kicked off by this white paper that I'm sure, Julie, I'm sure you're familiar with and others in the audience are familiar with that NCEL wrote, uh, you know, castigating the science of reading, one size fits all, it's harmful to English learners. And I was called by a couple of people, some in Illinois, someone here in California, saying, what are we gonna do about this? This is gonna really undermine everything. We have to write a response. We have to write a rebuttal. So, you know, I took a look at it and, um, you know, there were some things that were kind of, you know, questionable, but, but when I went to the, oh, sorry, I better plug in. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, but, when I, but when I took a look at the paper, um, if you look at the recommendations themselves, the recommendations were actually not that, not that off the wall, to use a technical term. Some of the, the pros in the report itself was not particularly well informed. The bigger problem was really the webinar that they put on that had some really unfortunate, and I'll just use the word outrageous claims about policies calling for 90 minutes of phonics and decoding and which turned out to be just sort of, I mean, those kind of things do happen, right? But we have to separate the science of reading from all the misinterpretations, from overzealous foundational skills advocates, right? That's the first error that I think NCEL made, that there's a distinction. You, you can't put that on the science of reading. You can put it on people who don't understand the science of reading or they willfully ignore portions of the science of reading. So there's a sort of undifferentiated muddle that was created per primarily in that, in that webinar. So anyway, the response that I wrote with a couple of colleagues, uh, some of you might know Linda Diamond, Elsa Cardenas-Hagen, Lillian Duran, who is one of my favorite Oregonians, along with Julie and lots of others. Um, we wrote a, a response where we really basically agreed and I would encourage, I think Beth, you told me, you put, I'm glad you brought, you put that in the, in the resources because you anticipated that this was gonna come up. So good on you, thank you. And we really agreed with a lot of what was in the recommendations. I mean, I basically ignored a lot of the text that came first and we looked at the recommendations and most of the things there were reasonable recommendations. So we had two categories of things, things we agree with and then things that we agree with qualifications because they weren't quite right. They weren't totally wrong but they weren't quite right. So the initial move was to try to find this kind of common ground. And from that came a series of conversations with some folks from the Reading League who are very strong advocates of reading science, as you might know, and then NCEL and Californians together. So we've had a series of conversations that have, I don't wanna characterize them, but they've been conversations and other things going on. And I don't know where it's gonna end up because I, I, I see some evidence on the part of NCEL of moderating their position. For example, they have, a com they have a comprehensive view of literacy that they put as part of this white paper. And then we've been you know, discussing about the importance of foundational skills, whether you're learning to read in Spanish or English or whatever, they're really important, they're not just Okay, and by the way, you know, do this. They're, they're really foundational. And in the most recent iteration of their comprehensive literacy framework, which was presented at an OELA webinar uh, a month or two ago, um, the document that was presented was, was actually, it was subtle and it was kind of buried, but it was significantly moderated because there was a recognition of how important these foundational skills are. They need to be taught systematically within a comprehensive framework, but it didn't soft pedal as much as previous statements, the importance of these foundational skills that are gonna be taught systematically, kids have gotta be given access to them directly and explicitly. So there are little bits of convergence, shall we say, but I think we're still a long way away from where we need to be. And, and I recently, I mean, I. I find dispiriting examples. I mean, most recently, a couple of days ago, someone emailed me a, a, a Twitter, a tweet saying that, you know, Jim Cummins was doing a podcast 
and then he and he was making the case that a maximum of 15 minutes decoding whole class decoding so the maximum should be 15 minutes you shouldn't go over that well it turns out he never said that he certainly doesn't believe it because i know him and we've been you know conversing about these kinds of things and they've you know they've recently you know taken that down but it's very disturbing that these kind of things are put out there then get propagated and people don't know what to believe because you i mean most of my teacher colleagues and my wife is a teacher so i have no interest in dissing but they don't have the resources or the wherewithal all the time to kind of dig up these things you know when i get these webinars that are making false claims i look at the references and see whether they're legitimate and very often they're not but most people don't do that they they, they don't you know they don't have the resources for that so i'm concerned about the misinformation the disinformation it's it's propagation and how it's just a disservice, I think, to everyone. I don't know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go off on a rant. I hope I answered the question. Uh, thank I, you. I mean, I, just quickly, yes, thank you, because I think it's really important to put out there that there seems to be this rift between the fields, and ultimately it is a disservice to students, so we have to figure this out. So thanks for your work. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so we've had some in the comments of, you know, we're so thankful for your willingness to have the tough conversations uh, with other co professionals in the field. So that's been very helpful. So um, I could speak for myself. This has been um, very valuable and seems like for others as well. Thanks, Nicole. Appreciate that. Um, we do have some more time um, and some more questions. Um, so switching a little bit. Um, so this is posed by Carrie. Hutchings. Is there research that lays out the progression of language, language acquisition and reading development? I assume it must be slower than that of an English only student. I ask because EL students are often over identified for special education. I wish there was a way to know what adequate progress looks like for ELL students. Great, super question. Um, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have actually in the past tried to you know, make some kind of correlation, not correlation in a statistical sense, but alignment of progress <clears throat> in language, different stages of language development and progress in stages of literacy development. Um, the, the, sh the short answer is th there, there really isn't, at least, at least nothing that I would feel comfortable saying is really sort of empirically grounded and and kind of tested. I don't know, J Julie or other people on the call might 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 have um, some suggestions or some resources. But let me just say this: uh, you know, it depends on what stage of literacy development you're talking about. Because early on, in beginning and early, when when foundational skills are really, you know, really key, you got to be learning other things as well. I want to keep emphasizing because people keep taking things out of context. But foundational skills are really key. And the best evidence we have from like longitudinal studies and so forth is un under conditions of, of good classroom instruction, good tier one instruction, English learners can make progress on those foundational skills, phonemic awareness, letter sound association, phonics, decoding, and some reasonable amount of fluency at about the same pace as English speakers. Now, of course, part of the challenge is the range is enormous. I mean, the range of language acquisition and literacy acquisition, I mean, kids vary a lot. And so you can find all sorts of examples at different parts of the continuum. So I'm talking about sort of on average. On average, English learners can make progress on foundational skills at roughly the same pace, very close to the same pace as English speakers. So that will last until say second, maybe third grade. Because what happens by third grade, the reading agenda really changes because language, meaning, and background knowledge become much more important. And it's at that stage of reading development when you enter, when you leave beginning and early literacy development and leave sort of the fluency stage. And I'm relying here on Gene Shaw's stages of reading development, which has been kind of one, one of the most influential things in my thinking to think about the, pro the progression of literacy development. Once you leave 
the beginning and early and early fluency stage and go into the intermediate stage, later fluency, intermediate, third grade and up. That's when language background knowledge kick in, become increasingly important, as I said in my comments. And that's where kids learning the language as they're learning to read it are really at more of a disadvantage. And the, the less their English proficiency is, the more at a disadvantage they are in making progress in learning to read in that language they're simultaneously learning to read. Well, they've gone past the initial learning to read and they're now moving into more intermediate consolidation, you know, more vocabulary, more words, more advanced, you know, decoding. That's when you really start to see the gap. So early stages, if you have kids, your English learners, who are really way behind in learning letters and sounds and phonemic awareness and beginning decoding, and you have a lot of those kids, then the the first thing to think about is what's wrong with our program, not what's wrong with our kids, what's wrong with our program. Because if you have a solid instructional program, English learners can make really decent, meaning adequate, average progress in those beginning skills. So if and if they're not, and if they're not, and if they're a minority, right, keep in mind that the general rule of thumb for how many kids are actually dyslexic or learning disabled is under 10%. Most estimates are maybe 5%, under 10%. So let's say in a classroom of 30 kids, it would not be unreasonable to expect that two or three kids have some kind of you know real dyslexia. If you've got half the class or a quarter of the class or a third of the class significantly behind, then there's something wrong with your instructional program. So that's the first thing to want to think about. What is the problem here? Is it the kids or is it the program? And if you've got a third or a quarter or half the kids way behind, something's wrong with your program. Now, if most kids are on par as they should be, and you have some kids having difficulty, well, then that's one of the reasons we, you know, you think you know, a screening instrument. In fact, one of the big debates right now, one of the big controversies in California is whether we should have universal screening. And one of the major opponents of universal screening are English learner advocates. Now, there's a reason for this, because in the past, there's been a tremendous amount of over-identification, because sometimes it's hard to separate whether there's a reading issue, potential dyslexia or something like that, or a cognitive processing problem, or whether the language development hasn't caught up or been as quick as it, as it should. So there's, there's a real problem, a potential problem there. And for years, we've had a lot of over-identification of English learners. But now we have the opposite problem. We have under-identification because people are afraid to identify kids early on because they don't want to confound language and literacy problems. So we have under-identification in the early grades. But guess what? It's kind of like a some you know you smooth a bump, but you just move it over because in fourth, fifth grade, that's where you have over identification because we haven't found kids who are having difficulties early on who are not necessarily dyslexic, but just have weak phonological sensitivity or have kind of not real strong short term memory or whatever kind of things can block acquiring literacy skills easily and early on. A lot of those kids could be helped with good certainly with good tier one instruction, that goes without saying, but then they're having some difficulty, good tier two instruction could sort of nip in the bud what will later turn out to be possibly dyslexia, which didn't need to be, but turned into that because assistance wasn't provided early on. So it's sort of a, a complex picture and you got to think about at what stage of literacy development students are, on, are in, what kind of instruction they've received and how and whether to start thinking, well, maybe we have a special ed case here. So I hope I haven't muddled the picture, but it, it's a complicated one. And as often as not, the problem is the kind of instruction the kids are getting in class. I mean, these are called instructional casualties. I mean, we, we know they exist, sadly. And one of our goals has to be to eliminate instructional casualties because we've got enough challenges with kids who are really have very, very weak cognitive or phonological skills, and they deserve a lot of intensive attention. I mean, they, they deserve it. 
And we're kind of diluting the amount of attention we can give them by not providing adequate instruction to other kids who could be helped under more normal circumstances. You know, some good tier one instruction and then follow up with tier two as needed. And they never need to show their faces in the special ed system. I'm um, sorry, I just went off on a tear. Please tell me if I answered your question. I don't know who asked it, but did I answer your question? Yes, and we put some other resources in the chat to some of the MTSS for EL uh, materials from Perfect. Julie and company. So. Perfect, thank you so much. Excellent, great. Okay, right, we have one minute. Um, so maybe we have time for a quick- um, I'll give a quick answer. On a quick answer. A quick yeah. answer. <laughs> Um, so a, a question that was posed was, is there research or experience um, that I guess you know of supporting the use of mouth posture photos, uh, i.e. lips um, or sound walls? Mouth posture protocols? Photos. Oh, photos. Like photos. showing how oh, yeah, the yeah, placement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is not my field. I mean, speech language, you should ask a, an SLP this, speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. But I know from some work and uh, presentations made by Elsa Cardenas Hagen that 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 you they work she works on these things. I mean, really forming the the the, the lip and mouth formation and position to articulate the correct sounds is is a thing and can really help kids. Now, one of the problems that I hear about is, you know. Accent correction has has sort of a bad name, you know. People feel that foreign accents, you know, they're they're part of your identity, and if you're trying to stamp out foreign accents, it's kind of like dissing someone's identity. I, I'm not going to get into all that. It becomes ideological, and I'll respect how people feel about how they talk. But if there is interest in helping kids form their mouths physically in a way that'll help them articulate the sounds that is helpful for both oral and written communication, then I think it's, those are tools and resources that can and ought to be used, the ideological and identity aspects of it aside. Thank you for that. Um, that is our time. We um, also uh, just wanna thank you again, um, for lending your expertise and uh, braving the the muddy waters and, <laughs> and having those tough conversations. I think it is, um, you know, you, you said that us being as a field divided is a disservice to our students, but I think uniting under respectful conditions and having these conversations is definitely a service um, to our, our students. And so we thank you for that. 